What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Let's Talk Live podcast. It is July 26, 2023. I had a little bit of a connection issue there for a second, but we are back and we are live. I have a very special show for you planned today, and uh, I'm very honored to have this guest live on the show today. We had some great communication over the last week, and I am just truly honored to have this special guest come in, but I'm not going to wait too much longer here. I'm going to bring her in. Uh, we have former FBI special agent and News Nation contributor Jennifer Coffin-Daffer joining the panel today. Hello, Jennifer. How are you? I'm doing great. And I just want to say I'm honored to be here. Thank you for asking me. And I look forward to our conversation. Yeah. Thanks so much for being here. Um, so I wanted to just talk, obviously, you know, Koberger is obviously lighting up the uh, the airways, Twitter, YouTube. I mean, it does. it seems like Everywhere we turn, there's a new story or someone's gripping, you know, trying to grip on to a new piece of information because they they might break this case. Um, but what <laughs> I wanted to do is before we get kind of into Koberger questions, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, the FBI and the FBI involvement in crime cases. My first question would be, uh, you know, how does the FBI typically respond to when law enforcement asks for assistance in an investigation? Well, typically what happens, uh, the chief of police will reach out to the head of the particular organization in terms of, is it an RA, that's a resident agency of the FBI? Is it a uh, main office of the FBI? Anyway, they will reach out to whatever the office is in their jurisdiction, and they will ask for help. And specifically, they want things like resources, manpower, uh, the lab, um, all those crime scene analysts, things like that. Uh, they, they just need help because they usually are with very small departments and don't have the uh, training, uh, the numbers and so forth. So once that call comes in, typically uh, the SSRA or the supervisor or the special agent in charge, whatever it may be, uh, will uh, assign a case agent. So they'll call somebody in and they'll explain the situation. And then they'll do the paperwork to what we call predicate the case. So they'll actually outline uh, the situation. For instance, if it were the Idaho 4 case, they would say, listen, we just had uh, four students murdered in Moscow, Idaho, and they need our help. So that would be predicated uh, really pretty much a rubber stamp and something like this. We might have a connection issue. Yeah, Jennifer's had some connection issues. So we'll, we'll try to get her back here in a minute. Uh, we'll wait for Jennifer to come in. <clears throat> oh, I think we got her back. <laughs> wow, that's so odd. Hopefully yeah. we don't lose each other. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, I'm sorry. So you got a little bit cut off there. You were just talking about what their involvement is in the investigation. <clears throat> Right. So hopefully everybody heard that. But essentially, the minute that that paperwork is signed off on and it would be quick and they can even give verbal authority while it goes through the imaginations of getting approved through our, com our computer system. But at that point, all the wonderful resources of the FBI become available to that case agent and then to that law enforcement authority. What is their involvement in, like, say, uh, a, a PCA? So we look at, like, the Moscow police, they conduct a PCA, they write that PCA. Does the FBI actually review that material as well before it's passed into evidence? Well, typically a probable cause affidavit that is to this degree, which was about 20 pages, and it was completed in a very short period of time. I mean, this took elaborate writing skills. It took the skills of multiple people to put in their parts. And I would submit that probably they had different authors write different parts. For instance, can you write the part FBI regarding to the cell phone information? Uh, to the lab people or, or a lab liaison, can you write the part concerning all the DNA and that analysis? And then they come together and they bring this product together uh, to the affiant. And the affiant, of course, is working to weave all the parts together. And ultimately, it's his product that he understands that he has read all the formative information that supports that affidavit and then goes before the judge and swears to it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the FBI, so when they come in, do they assume like the leading role or did they take more a, pa a more passive role? Uh, 
allowing law enforcement to determine the significance of their findings in a case? So let's, uh, we'll focus on if it's okay, the Idaho four, yeah, because absolutely. I will say every case is a bit different. But mm -hmm. in something like the Idaho four case, and I actually made a comment about this on News Nation, I think it was, maybe it was to Newsweek, maybe it was to both, um, about uh, how the FBI is, I think I said something like really in charge. And um, uh, Chief Fry didn't really appreciate that comment. But what I meant was there were 60 FBI agents assigned full time. So imagine as a case agent, you already have dozens of cases on your plate. You have things that are hopping too. But in this case, this was a matter of societal protection. Mm -hmm. They had a mass killer, uh, potentially a serial killer mm -hmm. out there. And so everything had to be dropped. So now you have 60 agents on top of that. You have Chief Fry, who was really at the head because the buck stops with him because he has the jurisdiction. The Bureau doesn't. Now, we came to know that he truly did cross state lines to mm -hmm. at right. least, again, he's not convicted. He is assumed innocent until right. proven guilty. But that is what the evidence is showing us. Um, if they would have known that from the beginning, could the FBI have taken the helm? Possibly. But typically, if it doesn't happen on a boat, a train, a plane, or in a um, mm -hmm. national uh, reserve uh, park or um, a federal uh, military institution, it's not federal authority. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, the Moscow Police Department had the primary jurisdiction and, um, but that's not to say that those 60 agents aren't out there making their own decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. They're not calling back and saying, Chief Fry, is it okay now if I interview this guy? No, right. they are running and gunning uh, with whatever they were tasked with. And same with all those analysts that were pouring over the information regarding the Elantra. They are not reporting to Chief Fry. They're reporting to their supervisor mm. at that division. So that's kind of what I meant in terms of the practical nature of it. Uh, the Bureau was running their portions of it. Got it. Got it. So is it permissible for the defense to utilize FBI investigation analysis, even if the prosecutors do not consider the findings uh, relevant? Sure. Uh, all of that discovery, all of those terabytes, what are we at now? 51, 51. terabytes or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. All of that is going to the defense. And it's such a huge uh, mission because they're going to want to pour through all of that and see if there's any sort of rabbit holes they could go down. Um, and it's a lot, but they're allowed to use anything, even if the prosecution doesn't use it in their case in chief, hmm. any one of those 51 terabytes the defense can run with and use to make their uh, analysis of what they think uh, happened. Sure, sure. So I know just before we came on live, we were talking about like the really hyper polarization of this case. Mm -hmm. How you have just some, just two extremes on both sides. You have like people that are ultimately in, you know, the Koberger camp. And again, I want to make sure that we we understand this on the live today. Ryan Koberger is innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. He'll get his his uh, you know his due date in court and go through the due process. Um, you know, in, on my podcast, you know, what I believe is that the evidence is very strong against Koberger. Um, so we were talking about hyperpolarization. You have, you know, people on this side that are just so extreme that, you know, this guy is the guy, but then you have, uh, you know, people that are just so much in the camp that this is an innocent guy plucked from society, frame job, <laughs> the, the authorities are involved, there's okay. other people involved. Um, you know, where do you think that comes from? you know, in inside people, or I've just never really seen, you know, this much attention uh, on a, a particular case like this. So I, I'd love to hear what your your opinion is on that. Well, and it, in backstage, we talked about how Gabby Petito, I think, was one of, you know, a huge instance of media draw, social media attention, uh, you know, much like Scott Peterson was. Yeah. But of course, we didn't have social media like we had then or, or Susan Smith. I mean, some of these cases that um, you just, they're jaw dropping in in what was I mean, done. In those Simpson. Cases. 
OJ Simpson, I, yeah. John Bonnet Ramsey. I mean, we could go on and on, but the difference now, I think, is the true social media mm -hmm. making yeah. such a difference. And uh, I think I told you, I was talking to uh, those in the media with the statistical numbers, and they said that Koberger just far uh, elevates above anything Gabby Petito in terms of uh, social media and mainstream media attention. And that was really surprising to me. Um, but what's more surprising is the polarization that you just mentioned. Uh, of course, on Gabby Petito's case, <clears throat> Nobody was polarized. Everybody said it was Brian Laundry, even yeah. though there wasn't one probable cause affidavit uh, for anyone to see. Um, but then you look at Brian Koberger and that probable cause affidavit is one of the best probable cause affidavits I've really ever seen written. I've written so many. Basically, what happens is when you're in law enforcement and if you see a crime occur before you, you're allowed to arrest somebody and then you have to go back and write a probable cause mm -hmm. affidavit to support a criminal complaint, right? So that's outside of the indictment process or the information process. So when you write these, typically you're just gonna put in just a spattering of your facts enough to get you over that probable cause hump. They went far beyond that in this affidavit with all the information regarding the cell phones, regarding the videos, regarding the DNA, the sheath, uh, the witness statement from Dylan Morton said it was, I call it probable cause plus. Yeah. And so that's what we've been able to really, it's the bedrock of what we know here in the public, right? Uh, other than the sources that have leaked information, this is the true bedrock. And I think the reason it became polarized, it was not polarized early, if you recall. Everybody kind of said, wow. I yeah. mean, everyone. Yep. No matter who it was, defense attorney, non-defense attorney, it's kind of like how people are reacting to the Rex Heuerman now. Uh, and I think we're going to see a, a change in that one, too. But in terms of people saying, ah, oh, he's not guilty, <laughs> there's nothing there. Um, and I think that in a lot of instances, and I actually did a poll on this because I love polls. They let yeah. me know what people are really yeah. thinking. Yep. And the poll really was about 90% uh, that it was either people who are just trying to make a name for themselves and, and start a podcast or, or, you know, step into the media ring. Um, or they're just individuals, you know, you can picture them with their Twix on one side and their Coke on another, just, you know, typing away with nothing else to do during their day, um, but sort of troll and, and put out really the unbelievable for attention, right? So I think there's a lot of reasons, but I think to give credit where it's due, uh, I think some people are possibly genuinely concerned about due process and that because so many uh, believe the evidence is so strong that he'll be sort of convicted in the pub public sector. Mm -hmm. But I think that is so ridiculous because most people know little to nothing about this case except for all of us, right? Right. <laughs> uh, newsies. <laughs> true crime people. We know this case inside and out. Yeah. But if you got, as an example, I got my hair cut today and I was talking to some of the ladies. They had never, they said, really? When were they killed? There were four people killed. Where? Yeah. When did they, do I need to know about this? Yeah. It's hilarious. If you go outside of our forum, There's very nothing. few people. Yeah. Yeah, no it's much. funny because I mention it to my colleagues at work, you know, when I tell them about my podcast and I'm like, I have this podcast and I'm covering this. And they're like, like, I've never even heard of that case. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's crazy. You know, it's crazy. So, um, you know, going back into Koberger as well. So many you know, and going back to kind of in this hyperpolarization, you know, many individuals believe that Koberger couldn't have acted alone. You know, we've heard that many, many times. And they find it very suspicious that they close that uh, that's closely associated with uh, with the case where, um, uh, you know, they think that this is, you know, it couldn't have acted alone. It can't be, it has to be multiple people. Um, so in your view, 
do you think there's any other particular parties involved? I'm going to tell you right now, I don't think so. And I may be wrong because wouldn't we have heard that someone else would have been arrested already or another suspect would have been been brought forward? Well, that's a great point. Uh, but no, I don't think anybody is involved, not only because nobody's been arrested, but also because this type of crime. This type of crime, and yes, there are killers that sometimes act in can tandem with, you know, sure. th there are killers like that. But this was so personal. This showed so much rage and loathing and preparation. This was something that was freeing for the person who did this. This was retribution after years of being made fun of years of not being able to get, this is my opinion, uh, the kind of person that Maddie and Kaylee were, sure. the funnest ones at the party, the beautiful ones, the vivacious, the ones that walk into a room and people notice. This was truly um, a retribution for that. So it's personal. And it wasn't anything that somebody would involve somebody else in. And people who conduct this stalking activity, you know, 12 times we've seen the phone in this area, people who do this, this is part of the enjoyment. This is the building to a full on climax of power and control. And they're not going to want to share that. So way before Brian Koberger was ever arrested, I think most uh, people in 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 my position or a position <clears throat> similar or that were, uh, you know, with my sort of background, we all believe that this would have been done by one perpetrator. Mm -hmm. um, so we recently just heard about the the alibi or the the, the standing silent alibi. You know, how yeah. do you perceive Koberger's recent uh, alibi? And, and his decision with his team to stand silent once again. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I considered it kind of analogous to a backhanded compliment. This was a backhanded alibi. It wasn't really an alibi. It's basically saying, listen, we're going to use the prosecution's witnesses sort of against their, their themselves. And they're going to, through testimony and cross-examination, they're going to basically provide some sort of information that it really wasn't Brian Koberger there. That's mm. kind of what they really, in a nutshell, are trying to say. That combined with experts, right? They're going to have experts on the stand to say, hey, he was actually in Alaska, according to his cell records. Okay, that's a bit out there. But you know what I mean. They're going to say he wasn't in Moscow, Idaho, mm. at the pertinent hours when the um, – cell information that law enforcement has gleaned says he was there. They're going to pick apart the videos, even though we've really just seen a handful of the videos and we've seen them in their worst state. We haven't seen them when they've been enhanced uh, for better uh, viewing. Mm -hmm. um, but they're still going to have experts to say, no, that's actually, uh, you know, a, a white Mitsubishi uh, vehicle or, you know, whatever vehicle they choose. So, Believe me, they will have experts that will come forward. And this is their plan, but I don't really call it an alibi. Sure. So um, just asking you here, and, and it's a great segue to what you just actually talked about. So when Ann Taylor speaks about questioning the prosecution's witnesses, whom does she imply and what does she intend to challenge in those questions during her questioning? What, it's such a your great opinion? question. Such a great question. I, I think the number one person she wants to get up on the stand, as we've seen, is Bethany Funk. Yeah. She wants Bethany Funk to say, I didn't hear anything. I didn't see anything. And I can just hear her droning away saying, you mean four people were murdered a floor away from you, two floors away from you, uh, and you didn't hear anything? Dylan Mortensen heard things. You know, you didn't hear anybody come in. You didn't hear the dog bark. And so I think she wants to turn Bethany's funk, funk's possible, ad, you know, admission to I was asleep and didn't yeah. hear anything. Turn that around. Uh, I think she also can't wait to get her hands on Dylan Mortensen. Um, 
We'll see how well she holds up. I could tell you from somebody who's been on the stand for hours and hours and hours as a, a case agent on different cases, it's grueling. Just imagine if you're sitting there in the hot seat and you have attorneys, three attorneys in this case, right? Are they up to three or four right now? I think there are four. Four. So, sorry, they just got yeah. the DNA expert yep. attorney. Four attorneys that have spent months and maybe by that time years uh, figuring out questions, um, um, forming ideas from 51 terabytes of information, um, doing whatever they can to discredit Dylan Mortensen, who, whoever's on the stand. They'll look at a minor case. I'll, I'll tell you something I wrote on a tweet accidentally, even though I've talked about um, ground penetrating radar and known mm -hmm. about it for years and years yeah, and yeah. years and decades. I put ground penetrating sonar. I don't even know why I put that. It was just kind of a brain fade. Uh, so I've got 20 tweets talking about GPR and one tweet where I accidentally wrote sonar. And somebody, of course, pointed that out, right? <laughs> That's what it's like on the stand, only yeah. it's happening in real time. And you accidentally say sonar and they say, see, see, you didn't, yeah. you weren't even there, were you? Because yeah. she's going to, you know, say, oh, I also saw eyelashes. Oh, you didn't say that in the probable cause affidavit. You know, you didn't say that in your first statement. So I worry about that um, young lady. I think she's going to be emotional. She yeah. probably has a lot of guilt for surviving, a lot of guilt over actions she did and didn't take. I think they are salivating to get a hold of her and try to turn her words upside down. Uh, she's a woman with likely absolutely zero experience testifying. And so those are the two main people I think she's going to focus on. Yeah, I, I've been saying here on my on my podcast and on my shows um, that I, I just feel like Ann Taylor's approach, and I call this kind of like the O.J. Simpson approach. She's gonna she's gonna attack the DNA evidence. She's gonna attack the the sheath that we know of right now. Uh, she's gonna attack the wit you know witnesses and their credibility. She's gonna get law enforcement on the stand and challenge their records. How did you collect the evidence? How did you you know? Uh, bag the evidence what was the process did you wear you know boots in the house you know did you have suits on you know i feel like they're almost like i feel like we're going to go right back to oj simpson and that's going to be the defense here i mean am i wrong on that or or do you kind of feel that as well i feel that it as well i think it is going to be a lot of mud up against the wall let's just see what sticks we only need one juror yeah, one, juror one juror to have some sort of sympathy or doubt and then it, it could be a hung jury um, so that's what they're you know, hoping for. Certainly. Um, I agree with you. I think the good news is, and I know some people aren't going to like me saying this, but I don't think it's going to be televised. It may yeah. be streamed and then later they'll release it, how he's done the rest of the hearings or the, mm -hmm. the hearings today. I don't even know if he's going to allow that. I say that because we are talking about victims, victim statements. Um, I don't, I mean, if it were me, I certainly wouldn't. If I were the judge, I don't want a menagerie. Yeah. I don't want all this posturing and posing and acting and like what happened in OJ. And I think how they handled, I believe, Lori Vallow. Uh, yeah, the Lori Vallow case, they just had people you know, making drawings and reporting on what happened. I hope they do that. I know that upsets some people because they feel like they have a right to be able to see yeah. the proceedings. I just, I always look at only four things in this case, Zana, Ethan, Absolutely. Maddie, and Kaylee. And for them to get justice to me, that's all we should all really care about at the end of the day. I think like, I, I think for me, you know, having that camera in the courtroom, or in just having it live is going to is going to give us the best transparency that we can see because there's so many questions in this case about you know is it an Elantra or isn't an Elantra the 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 knife sheath where's the murder what you know I just want absolute complete transparency for mm -hmm. these victims because they they deserve that and I just feel like there's been so much mud that has slung and, and again we're going back to that hyperpolarization where Everything, you know, it's been slung on both sides 
And I think the fairest way to do this is, you know, have that camera in the courtroom. But I do agree. I, I don't think that we're going to get that. I know we all want it, um, but I, I, it just might not happen. Just even looking at how uh, Judge Judge, which has an amazing name, by the way, I love that <laughs> name, <laughs> how Judge he, uh, yeah, how he even just said, like, look, you know, during these proceedings, if the camera is going to be completely on Coburg or zooming in and zooming out all the time, I'll just shut it down in a second. So, I mean, I know he's going to be ultimately very fair through this trial and wants to be fair because this trial is so important to this community, the, the nation and the world, you know, to get it right. And, you know, if if Brian Koberger is guilty, then he deserves to go away uh, or, or, you know, uh, uh, he deserves the death penalty in the state of Idaho. But if he's not and he is innocent in the in the in the jury and the uh, evidence shows that then we still got a lot of work to do, you know, and I say that just in the, in, in the community, you know, they still have a lot of work to do to investigate and find out who did this. So, <clears throat> um, so yeah, if I can, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jen. Jennifer, I said, no, ahead. no, I agree. I agree with you. You know, I agree with you about the transparency. I just don't know if it has to be on camera transparency. We need to know about everything that's presented and, you know, see all the evidence that right. has to be done. Can it be done without cameras is the question. And remember, I don't know if you remember this, I bet you do. When Judge Judge was on the stand, he pronounced two of the victims' names inaccurately. Yeah. And he was crucified yeah. in mainstream media, social media, all forums. I mean, the, the victim parents were mortified about it, at least some of them, and came forward. My point being is that that gave him a taste of what one or two mistakes yeah. can mean to him. And I don't, I think that will come to bear uh, when we don't see cameras. Yeah. Um, so if I can just go into the, the 911 call, because that has been the, the biggest, one of the most hyper polarizing, you know, parts of this case, what do you, you know, how do you interpret the sig significance of that eight hour delay or how do you process that? What, what in your opinion might, might've happened? I don't know if you've talked about that, but I, I'd love to hear what your opinion, you know, might've happened. Well, so the first person that would have known about this and knew about it the whole time was Dylan Morrison, right? We don't have any other information that anyone else would have been first to really realize that something happened. Now, she would, I, I think she didn't know anything about the murders. She certainly knew there was an intruder. What that intruder had done, I, I don't think she had any of the faintest idea. Mm -hmm. I think she locked herself, she peeked out, I'm picturing this. Sure. She peeked out for a third time. Her eyes probably got about this big. And, and she was just completely frightened and who wouldn't be by the way right you're 21 years old by all accounts she was heavily intoxicated i should say heavily let's just go with the word intoxicated and it was very late at night so all of us know what it's like to be up at four in the morning at some point in our lives it's you're exhausted and i think she closed that door really just trying to deal with the fright she was feeling. I think she is one of the people in the flight, freeze, or fight syndrome that totally froze. I think she receded to her bed and just passed out, fell asleep, never to wake up again for hours. Mm -hmm. I think when she did wake up, that part of the puzzle is confusing to me because did Bethany wake up before her? Uh, did anybody just come over to the house and, and you know, open up that door and, and see something first? We know there was a crew of of kids there. Yep. And yeah. And we've heard so many rumors, including one <clears throat> from a mother, right, that really gives a full account of what happened. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether all of that is true or part of it's true. I think in the FBI, we have a saying that where there's a little bitty seed of a rumor, it usually will lead to the truth. Yeah. It's usually like this much that you hear <laughs> through the rumor mill, but then you can find the truth from it. So I certainly think that um, it's terrible, the hiatus of time, 
from what I understand, it wouldn't have saved a life because they were so brutally murdered. Um, but it's hard to explain. Uh, people are angry, but I think that that is just very simply what happened. I can tell you, I have uh, 20 year olds, 20 mm -hmm. year olds that go out and these 20 year olds get home at about two 30 in the morning with all their buddies. Yeah. They order a bunch of pizza. <laughs> they all sit around and talk about goodness knows what I can hear them. They're hilarious, you know, <laughs> and then they finish the pizza and then they all go to bed. And then right. at noon, they get up. They wake up, right? I remember those days. <laughs> yeah. I mean, many of us have been there, and it's it's pretty normal in the college life, you know, for yeah. a college student. Um, and so, while it seems odd to a forty year old who doesn't have that lifestyle, it is so normal for a twenty year old. And I can just see her waking up, you know, at whatever nine, ten, eleven o'clock, thinking. Is that all just a bad dream or what happened right. and coming out? And then who knows what she saw at that point. Let me take it back to the PCA really quick. And I've, I've always wondered this and we've, we've talked about this a lot. So it says uh, in the PCA uh, with referring to the time frame, it says, you know, with the downloads of Bethany Funk and Dylan Mortens's phones, we believe that the crime happened between 4 a.m. and 425 a.m. Do you think, in your opinion, that there's any possibility that Dylan or Bethany Funk might have been texting during that exchange, or there was some phone calls in the house that evening, you know, maybe out to the, the the corresponding phones saying, "Hey, you know, what's going on? You know, do you hear what's going on? Do you do you think that that might have happened?" I do think that's possible. I really do. I think they could have been uh, texting boyfriends, texting each other. I think you know, Dylan could have texted Bethany and just said. Oh my gosh, she won't quit playing with, sure, you know, sure. Murphy. Who knows? Right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's a great, very uh, detailed little catch and find there uh, that they put in there. And I think they had to put it in to really define why we're looking at this 20 minute window. And I think that it's the cell phones are going to tell a lot of why they yeah. know. Yeah, I think Cass is going to come huge in this case. I mean, as we saw in Murdoff, I mean, it basically placed him within feet, you know, almost inches of where that crime happened. And I, you know, as much as people try to dismiss this, I think that there's going to be multiple ways within that cast information to really lock in uh, Koberger allegedly in this area around King Road, uh, you know, within the time that they said that. And I think that, you know, going forward, you know, as this information evolves and we have you know, what are we at, like 5G now? And we have all these super towers and, you know, all these cameras that are everywhere. And uh, I think that CAS is going to be a very significant, important in cases in the future. Uh, and I think that, you know, it's really pe when people say, you know, I wasn't there. Well, you had your cell phone with you and we can locate you. Uh, I think this is going to be a huge uh, factor in cases going forward. How do you feel about that? I, I think you stated it so well. I mean, Really, the cast report, uh, which is going to discuss all the cellular information, the cast team is in headquarters in the laboratory. They are amazing. This is what they do as special agents and supervisory special agents. That's the one that testified at the Murdoch case. He's really the king of cast, and he's going to be able to make all the mumbo jumbo yeah. He breaks it down and makes it very easy to understand. He's going to have amazing charts. He's going to show why it's really a science. It's foolproof. It doesn't go away. And it's not, it's like a fingerprint or DNA. It's there and they're going to be able to show it. So they can bring in all the, um, you know, experts that they want to say, well, really, couldn't it have been there? No, they're going to prove it. I agree with you. It's going to be a, major part of the case and we're going to know probably the first individual that came upon the bodies yeah because that cell phone because those kids they're like an umbilical cord yeah it's going to be with those kids right when they found the bodies we're going to know who found it who all saw it who ran out of the house who collapsed 
I think we're going to know all of that as part of the cast report. I mean, I'll be honest with you, the most anticipating moment for me right now is that opening statement to start giving some, you know, because, you know, this is the thing is like everybody keeps saying they read that PCA and they think that that is the only evidence that's going to be introduced in this case. I'm like, it's probably five to maybe 20 percent of what we heard yet. You know, a case in, in, you know, people don't understand sometimes is that a case is constantly investigated while it goes through trial. You know, there's there's other evidence that could be entered as well, too. And I just don't think that all the cards have been laid on the table. We're going to hear some really, you know, polarizing information, you know, evidence when this starts to, to come out. And just in my opinion. No, you're right. In the scheme of things, if you think of it as a deck of cards laying down there, all the suits, right now we're seeing about the two through five of clubs. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, yeah, we got a lot more to go here. <laughs> we got a lot more to go. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about some uh, recently leaked video footage that of security cameras. And there's been, oh God, there's been countless Twitter feeds about it. There's been countless youtube videos about it i've done i've talked about it on my show uh and it's surrounding in and around the activities of uh king road that evening so i wanted to get your opinion on it a couple things one uh do you think it's credible two uh why would this footage be you know leaked and you know it may be in your opinion if, it, if you feel that it's credible you know who would get a hold of this stuff and leak it and, and why? <laughs> well, all such great questions. And it's kind of like when the sound came out, you know, that sound piece that yeah, was yeah. thought to possibly be, yeah. right? And then now we have this video. When I see these things come out and there's zero source, they just kind of show up on the Twitter waves. Yeah. Um, when I see that happen, it immediately alerts me as to whether it's really credible or not. This one seemed more credible than normal. It really did look like, mm. uh, I thought, sort of a ring camera, Yeah. Um, the way it was situated. Um, the timing is off, right? A lot of people, I, I won't name names, but we're making a big deal about the dark shadowy figure but they forgot yeah. to look and see it was one o'clock in the morning not at four o'clock in the morning uh and then you know because people are so want to just look i'm the first to come up with this look right. i'm the first to see this <clears throat> look, and, and not really evaluating um uh, so at the end of the day at the end of the day i think the truck that is seen on that video if in fact it's accurate is totally inconsequential I, I, you know to really understand this case i think is to know what it's live what it is to live like at a small college town mm -hmm. people are up at four in the morning now is it quiet on the streets yes but i'm just saying compared to a lot of other places in a college town you're going to still have people up that just finished that pizza and they're headed back across town um so anyway uh I found nothing important at all about the truck, if it's even real. Uh, back to the footage, though. The PCA is so specific about mm -hmm. the turns he took. And if you look, and I was going to actually post this, the cameras that I think are actually involved. There's three other cameras that I think that they use, and I'm sure there's many others that we can't see. But just in looking at, you know. Right different photographs yeah i think that's what was used to show his drive-by his three-point turn his leaving his coming and going i don't know that this footage definitely was important um could have been so back to my opinion all of those videos and sound bites things that come in i pretty much ignore for me it's not important What's really important is the PCA and mm. what it says. And if that video perhaps gives a small snippet that corroborates that turn, that's great. Yeah. But it's so unimportant in the big scheme of things. That's how I, big scheme of things in terms of what it's really showing us is nothing we didn't know. Yeah. 
So I got two more questions, and if if we could, and I and I I want to just again thank you for your time today. Uh, this oh, this God. interview has been great. Um, I know my audience really appreciates, and I I appreciate it as well. Um, I got two more questions for you, and if you don't mind, if we could take maybe a couple questions from the chat. Uh, and, all right, we'll pull those up in a couple seconds. So among all the various types of evidence that we've seen so far, we've heard about cast evidence, we've heard DNA evidence, video footage, uh, the 51 terabytes of digital information, eyewitness accounts. Uh, which piece of evidence do you believe is going to be the most compelling and influential during this trial? The DNA. People want to downplay touch DNA. Right. The differences between DNA. Did it come from a hair follicle? Did it come from blood? Did it come from uh, semen? Did it come from saliva? No, this came from touch. So if you can imagine that sheath, and for those of you in your audience or you perhaps that carry a knife, I carried a knife for years on the SWAT team. When you have a sheath, it has to be snug and it has to be tight. You can't risk either one reaching down for your knife and it's not secure and you're cutting yourself mm -hmm. or losing it as you're mm -hmm. running or as you're tackling a, you know, somebody that you're supposed to be arresting. You can't risk that, right? So I kind of wanted to reiterate how tight a K-bar nice sheath snap is. And, and I welcome any of your folks to go check it out. It's tight. Yeah. Um, it's not like a little snap on your dress. So you can imagine the friction that would be uh, that would uh, come when you go to unsnap that, and then the cells on your fingers and the and the the liquid in your fingers, right? That perspiration right. of sweatiness that skin, all came skin follicles. Off. Yeah, your yeah. skin. Yeah, because we, exactly. we constantly shed. We constantly shed. Yeah, and this isn't just shedding. Yeah. Right. This isn't just I touched uh, this right. chair. This is friction causing right. that. And I think right. that's why, luckily, it there was enough of it. And luckily, it was there. And so I think they're going to be able to explain that. And for all the people who say, let's look at let's look at our choices. Right. OK. No, he touched somebody who then touched somebody who touched the sheet. You know, they shook hands. Right. that's not going to fly because where is that person's DNA? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, he did touch the sheath, but then he sold it or somebody stole it. What evidence do we have of that? And then that person just happened to go kill these people. Mm. You know, the, the person who stole the sheath or the person he lent it, lent it, lent it to, <clears throat> it's just, there's Occam's razor is um, a philosophy that those of us in law enforcement trying to solve crime always use. And it comes down to this. The easiest and simplest solution is usually what yeah, happened. Yep. Yep. You know, you don't have to extrapolate all these. It's, it's really quite simple. And when you start trying to weave in really the unlikely next to the impossible, it just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And I think that DNA is going to stick. And I think that's going to be the huckleberry. Mm. So I got one more question about the the trial. And then uh, maybe we can take some uh, audience questions. So uh, quick, real quick. Do you think, and I don't think so. Do you think this trial is going to happen in October? And do you think that we see a change of venue? It will not happen in October. Uh, maybe October of 2025 or 2026. Um, I don't look for this trial to happen for a very long time from now. There's 51 terabytes. Uh, this defense team is four lawyers strong. Right now, we already know of at least three experts that have been hired. Uh, they have to have time to write reports and mm -hmm. to mull over evidence. <clears throat> There's just no way that this can happen earlier. Now, could he plead? It's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Um, but the bottom line is, I think it, it's going to be a long time from now. Sure. All right. So we have a question here from Lou and Lou asked, Jennifer, can you explain the significance of the DNA at the time of the case pre-trial versus the DNA coming up from other locations of the crime scene during trial and how Bill Thompson will present this? 
Okay, so right now, the only DNA we know about, I want to make sure I get Lou's question right, sure. is the DNA on the knife sheath. sheath. In, right. right. In fact, we have heard through, well, not heard, we read through the defense documents that according to the defense, there wasn't DNA, didn't talk about bodily fluids, you know, something that could have been degraded. It only said DNA was not found in the apartment, the office, the car, or his parents' house, right? That From the victims, from the victims. Right. So they made that crystal clear. That was their way of really, you know, trying to throw in a little reasonable doubt to me, to the public. What they didn't say, and did you notice this? They yes. didn't say that there was no DNA of Brian Koberger's found at the house aside from the sheep. Right. I think if there would have been no DNA of Brian Koberger's found anywhere in that house, I think they would have pointed it out. I could be wrong. Maybe they just were remiss. Um, but so right now we don't have any other DNA. If there is any other DNA that comes in, uh, they will definitely have to deal with that, what type it is, where it came from separately. Sure. So Jessica has a question. She's asking about what you think about the latent footprint. That's been a big question uh -huh. as well, too. Yes. Such a great question. So we all know that that footprint was not visible, right? They had to do special testing um, with Amino to pull out and to actually even see that footprint, which I also found very interesting. You know, I really am of the belief that he... Uh, was well uh, shrouded, if you will. I think this is just my belief. Uh, I really believe he had a full-on black tight yeah. pantsuit underneath a coverall type situation. I think he personally stripped it all down, threw it in a bag that he had on the ready in one of the cargo pants pockets. And I can tell you, yes, that's easy to do. You just fold them up. They're right there in your pocket. We do it all the time. Right. Um, and I think he, when I say we do it all the time, when you need a bag at a crime scene or something like that, sure. these cargo pants, they can hold a lot. And I think that's what he did. And I think he disrobed. And why do we see one footprint? I, I think for, um, for those of you who have been to a stabbing, uh, but some of your audience may not have, it's not like there is blood everywhere, everywhere on the ground, right? Now, as you're stabbing, you get blood all over you. It spurts out. You hit arteries. It's on walls, on ceilings, on your face, on your body, right? It's all over this way. But then if you're laying in bed and you're attacked in your sleep, like I believe Maddie Mogan was, and you're ruthlessly attacked, that blood is going to seep down and, right. and drain slowly and then drain toward, you know, depending on the elevation of the house, toward the side of that room, which we yep, saw. The point, and, yep. Yeah, yep. the low point, right? So not necessarily where your feet would be standing. I mean, the feet, that's the least part. So it made sense to me that maybe one foot actually got in some blood. And one didn't because I don't picture the blood being there. In fact, I think that blood would have been later, you know, probably from the encounter with Zanet and Ethan. So I have a question from Laura. She says, what is the significance of Brady Giglio to do? Is it to do with the case or a previous instant? I believe, and she's saying, I believe a previous instant, instance, sorry. Well, it, it could be both, but typically what happens, for instance, let's just talk about Giglio. And I pronounce it Giglio. I've heard other people say Giglio. I say Giglio. I, <laughs> I pronounce it Giglio. There's Giglio. Anyway, yeah. uh, we always called it Giglio. I don't know if we're right or wrong. Um, there were agents that had Giglio because at some point during their career, they did something where they either lied about it or they did something that caused an issue for their credibility and they could not testify. Got it. When that happened, uh, typically the U.S. Attorney's Office was <clears throat> notified. There literally is like an index of who those people are. And agents can actually go on to become, some become coordinators, right? They coordinate dive teams. They coordinate 
you know, the informant room. And so they don't necessarily have to be fired depending on what happened. Now, if they were under oath and lied, they're automatically fired. But I'm talking about something that would be more subtle than that. Maybe something that happened in their personal life with a spouse or something like that. Right. But nevertheless, it's it's Giglio and they can't ever testify again. Uh, The bureau would never put anybody out there with any Giglio. You know, they're on the surveillance squad. They're being a coordinator somewhere, something like that. Okay, so same in law enforcement. You know, there are people that have Giglio and typically when that happens, say they go on an interview, there'll be somebody that's clean or doesn't have a Giglio issue. And so they might go and help. um, But the person who testifies, the person who is the affiant, the person who writes the report is going to be Mm. um, that person with that Giglio. Okay. Mm. Brady is a little bit different. Of course, Brady can be anything of a negative nature that has to be disclosed to the defense. So the defense has full knowledge of anything that could be of negative impact to that case. And so they're a little bit different because one is more pointed actually on the agent or on the officer's behavior. If that helps, hopefully that does. (laughs) Really great. I'm Thank just you. tearing it down to pragmatically what it means. We could talk about legalese all day long, right. but it's more important, I think, to understand what does that mean to this case and to those agents and officers. Sure. So we have the mystery question, and this is the million dollar question. I'd love to hear your opinion oh, on great. this. Uh, this comes from uh, Diana, and she says, Do you think that they have the murder weapon? Of course, in the, the Brian Koberger case. All right. You ready? <laughs> Negativo. I really don't think they have it. Mm. I could be wrong. I don't think they have the knife. I don't think they have the bloody clothes. I don't think they have the booties. I don't think they have the gloves. I don't think they have the, and I'm going to say this right, the balaclava, not yes. the baklava. That's a yeah, dessert. The balaclava. <laughs> uh, basically the, yep. the mask or yep. the cap. I don't think they have any of that. I think in that time frame that he left that house, and he was gone um, driving around those back roads. I think he buried it or somehow got rid of it in a waterway. He did something with it. This is just my belief. Sure, sure. I don't think we'll ever see it again unless wow. he someday cooperates wow. and tells us what he did or law enforcement gets lucky because law enforcement does get lucky. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so that's possible. I think the knife that was recovered from the house. You know, just, some have their, I think one was a Smith and Wesson and the other one just said knife. Number I think one that just was, said knife. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Knife, which to knife. me means oh, they had oh, a knife, oh. no designation on it. So yeah, yeah, I don't think so is the short answer. Mm, Sorry, mm. I gave a long answer. That's okay. That's okay. We love long answers. So uh, Angela's asking, why do you think they still haven't released the 911 call? That's been the big, the big thing here. What, you know, another, another mystery in this case. <clears throat> They aren't going to. That is a huge piece of this case. Mm. Um, That is going to disclose who found the bodies likely. It's going to disclose all the mania that was occurring uh, in and around that house. uh, Who was there? So a lot of people who don't want their names out in the public, uh, they're going to want to protect them. Um, There is no way we're seeing that till trial. That's Mm. my opinion, unless it's leaked. Mm. Terry's got a quick question. She says, why uh, would the defense leave themselves scrambling during the trial with cross-examination if he has an alibi? (laughs) Because he doesn't have an alibi, Terry. (laughs) Um, He doesn't have an alibi. If he had an alibi, he would come forward. He would have uh, at least uh, the witnesses or or what makes up that alibi, because that has to be presented so that the prosecution has a chance to question those witnesses, to look at, at the facts and circumstances that would support an alibi. Um, this makes it very clear there is no alibi. And as I said, uh, truly, they're just hoping that they can get one of their witnesses to slip up and say something uh, that would sure. be positive for yeah, them. That, yeah, like that, as that, an that, example, if they can get Dylan to say, uh, 
you know, really, I think he was only five foot five and wow. weighed like 300 pounds, right. you know, that <clears throat> could be exculpatory and show that, see, my client wasn't there. My client doesn't look like right. that. This is the type of, of, of what they're trying to do, in my opinion. Sure. Do you have time for just a couple more questions? Sure. Okay, great. Appreciate you. Uh, so uh, Karen's asking, and then we're going to go back to some old school, old school detective work here. And they used to pull the old, the photos out and they'd show you a little lineup. So Jennifer's asking a question. Uh, Jennifer, do you think Dylan would have been shown a photo of Koberger and asked to possibly confirm that's who she saw? No. I think, of course, she was interviewed well in advance of anyone knowing about Brian Koberger. Uh, she would have been interviewed uh, not for a few minutes. She would have been interviewed, at my belief, is for hours. And I think she would have been interviewed definitely more than once. Um, that would be the normal protocol, uh, uh, you know, as they went back and maybe had questions. Also, as she started remembering more clearly, no, I don't think they showed her a picture of Brian Koberger at all. I think they strictly went off of her um, information about what she thought she saw that night. Mm. I got a quick question for you, actually. When do you think Brian was, uh, do you think, yeah, when do you think that Brian was uh, interrogated? Yeah, There's a rumor out there that he had been questioned for about 15 minutes and then shut down. Do you think that uh, uh, Payne was actually the person that did speak with him? And if he did, could it have been in person or would they have done maybe like a Zoom call? Because there's a rumor um, out there that that, that happened. Oh, I don't think that's a rumor. I do think he spoke early on, you know, like in a cooperative sure. mode. And I think that the Moscow uh, case agent, Payne, uh, and others would have been flown out there. Uh, certainly, okay. um, they knew the most about the case. Uh, they would never put that, uh, no matter what, when you're the case agent on something like this, you fly to where it is because you okay. know so much. Um, and then I think he you know, shut down, shut down like you up. said, 15 yeah. minutes very early. Yeah. Okay. Cause there was a lot of, it was a lot of back and forth about that. I heard a lot about it and there was a lot of rumor of like when that happened, when could have happened? Did they fly there? Were they on the plane when he was extradited? You know, it was just a lot of, a lot of questions to that. So, um, so I got another quick question here. Uh, does, uh, Jennifer, do you think that the crime was sexually motivated at all? So when we say sexually motivated, uh, there are um, different sorts of um, people who commit these crimes, like, say, a John Wayne Gacy mm -hmm. or a Jeffrey Dahmer or a Bundy or a Dennis Rader. Those those uh, particular killers, they reach climax because of the control that they exercise because of the uh, position of power, uh, even by just doing the surveillance and, and just the working up to that climax. And then certainly the kill is sexual in nature, but, but led by power, if that makes sense. It's sure. the power yep. and control, control that leads them to climax. Yeah. This killing is not like that. This is like a Jack the Ripper. Mm. Uh, this is like an L.A. Ripper. This is like um, um, the uh, Roger incel. Mm. You know, this is truly, again, this is my opinion, a loathing. This is a hate. This is nothing that was sex sexually gratifying. This was gratifying in every way, mm. um, but not uh, to reach somebody to a climax. That wasn't his purpose. It was really to exercise complete power and control. Hmm. So I have one more question. And then uh, we'll, so we got here from uh, Laura's asking regarding the latent print, how, uh, why or how was the print latent? Oh, it, when they call it latent, latent is another word for hidden. Okay. Um, it's something that can't be seen by the naked eye. And so they have to use special chemical products and so forth to retrieve it, much like a fingerprint. A lot of fingerprints, some you can see on glass, but many fingerprints are left that we can't see. And then we use special products to lift that fingerprint um, out based on um, aminos and oils and things like that. Great. I appreciate that. Listen, Jennifer, I appreciate you for your time. 
uh, appreciate you here for your, your service to our great country. And, uh, you know, we love you here on LTL podcast. We follow you on Twitter. We always bring up your news nation videos and discuss them here on the panel. And, uh, we have a really good time with that. So, um, listen, I really appreciate this to give a smaller channel, to have this opportunity to meet with someone that's on a national world news, uh, station is just, it's a real honor here. I know my audience really, um, uh, appreciate this as well. And, um, you know, it, it, it's just, it's a really cool feeling that you would do this. It really, it really is. So, uh, you know, we do appreciate that. No, thank you so much. And I have to say, and I, I don't know whether these audiences are just getting so much more and more knowledgeable, but look at those questions. I, I mean, those are the types of questions I would expect from another FBI agent that just oh, didn't know that. anything about the case. Like, yeah. Your questions and your audience questions were great. I, I hope I helped answer them. And we're going to get all the answers. It can't come soon enough. Um, but thank you so much for um, tuning in on Twitter. That's my only social yeah. media I use. There's a, a several uh, documentaries that are in the make, though, uh, that I'm looking forward to doing. And um, hopefully you can tune in for some of those if you're not too bored. And thanks again for having me. Yeah, we'd love to have you back sometime. Maybe we can have you on again sometime later down the road as we kind of catch up with Koberger. And there's so many other cases hitting. Uh, we know the Long Island serial killer right now is a yes. going to become a huge case. If I can just get just get you real quick before you go. Sure. What do you make of this case? If this if Rex is the person that did this, could this go down in, in your opinion as one of the most prolific serial killers of all time? Well, we'll see. You know, they have him, I believe, dead to right on three, and it's going to be four. They just had to get him off the streets. I think they were really concerned that he was going to pick up somebody else and commit more crime. So they sort of got him when they had to, balance, doing that balancing act. And so, uh, but they'll they'll also charge him, I believe, with number four. Um, the rest of the six that are in Long Island, those bodies... Yeah. I think some may be related and some are not related. Wow. Also remember, they have not run his DNA through CODIS hmm. because of a New York snag where he would have had to be convicted of either a felony or misdemeanor. For, this is what they're saying. Uh, we'll see how that all ferrets out, um, you know, what they end up doing. But they're going to be able to compare him to unsolved cases in South Carolina, Las Vegas, and any other trips he took if they have the specific DNA to turn in. So it's not near as good as CODIS, but it's better than nothing. Um, but I think there's a good chance that he continued to... Um, commit crimes, he would have had to find another dumping yard. And I wonder if it was South hmm. Carolina. We're going to yeah. see. All right. That is Jennifer Coffendaffer. You can follow her on Twitter. Her Twitter handle is at Coffendaffer FBI. She's a, a contributor on News Nation as well, as all of you know here. Jennifer, thank you so much for your time today. I do truly appreciate it. Thank you. Great audience. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, that was Jennifer Coffendaffer. So I'm going to wrap this one up here. I appreciate everybody tuning in for this episode of the LTL podcast. I will be back this evening at 9.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to debrief. We'll talk and discuss the Coffendaffer interview. I hope that you all enjoyed this. It was a it was a uh, a long time making, but we we got it together today. And Jennifer was absolutely an amazing guest, and I hope that I can get her back here sometime. And I think it's very nice of her to give the opportunity to a small channel like this to come on and have a very professional interview here. Um, I had such a great time here with her today, and uh, I look forward to her joining LTL again in the future. Okay, I'm going to take a little bit of a break. Go over and check out Titani uh, Tanya's channel today, Titanium Built. Um, she probably has a stream going probably at 8.15, her regular time. And then I'll be back here at 9.15. We'll do a debrief of the show. Uh, I'd love to go back over and recap it. We can do that this evening. Come in, come on in for the late show. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'll see you all tonight at 9.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Till then, have a great day and be safe. Bye, guys. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,